Delusions of grandeur or a democratic right? Catalans say they'll declare independence 48 hours after holding their referendum. But Madrid is determined to not let it happen. I'm Imran Garta and today's newsmaker is Catalonia's Spanish standoff. In a few short months, there could be a new country on the map. That's if pro-independence campaigners in Catalonia get their way. The region in northeastern Spain is set to vote in a referendum in October on whether to break away. Spain's prime minister says they're deluded for thinking it'll happen. But supporters say they have a right to self-determination. The only thing is, we've been here before. Three years ago, Catalans voted overwhelmingly to leave and nothing happened except for the punishment of the leader who organized it. But this time, it'll be different, they say. And Spain seems to be taking the threat seriously. Who has the momentum in the build-up to the vote? And what does it mean for the future of Spain? We begin the conversation with this report from Shoaib Hassan. It's the latest salvo in what's so far been a seesaw battle of attrition. Spain's Catalan region is on the brink of a referendum on independence from Madrid. If the majority of votes are in favor of creating the Catalan Republic, the independence of Catalonia will be declared immediately. In the past, the central government has responded by threatening to use all means at its disposal to prevent the referendum from happening. But this time, the criticism has been more restrained. To all Catalans, to all Spaniards, I want to tell you to maintain confidence in the future as authoritarian delusions will never defeat the serenity and harmony of our democratic state. The rare self-control comes despite growing demonstrations as the day of the referendum, set on October the 1st, approaches. The Spanish state grows in confidence as cracks have appeared in the opposition camp. Catalonian President Carlos Puigdemont fired his business minister Jordi Baiget after he said the central government could easily prevent them from holding the referendum. While Puigdemont says that all Catalonians are united on this issue, Madrid controls many crucial federal institutions. It's a surprising turn of events for the movement. It had gone from strength to strength since being launched by then-Catalonian President Arthur Mas. He held a non-binding vote in 2014, asking Catalans if they wanted a referendum to decide if they wanted independence from Spain. The result was a resounding yes, but it was held after Spain's main constitutional court had ruled the exercise illegal. Arthur Mas was charged with contravening the order and has now been sentenced to a two-year term, preventing him from holding public office. He says he has no regrets. If we look for the ideal moment, we won't find it. Now we have a country in movement. We have done a lot of things in the last four or five years. We have a parliament with an absolute majority in favor of a Catalan country. So we have to seize the opportunity. Will this then be Catalonia's Campe Diem moment? Or will the movement fall apart so close to the goal? And as October the 1st beckons and Catalonians appear positive of victory, are Madrid and Catalonia on a collision course regardless of the outcome? Shoaib Hassan, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Barcelona by Oriol Amoros. He's the Secretary for Equality, Migration and Citizenship for the Government of Catalonia. In London, we have Javier Farge, a journalist who is against this referendum. Also with us is the director of the Social and Political Observatory, Leopoldo Moscoso in Madrid. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us. Javier, let me begin with you. They're going to vote, and if they vote yes, they're going to break away from Spain within 48 hours. They have a right to do that, don't they? No, they don't. Why? I'll tell you why. First of all, well, this referendum is unconstitutional. In 1978, the Spanish people voted a constitution that does not allow an independent referendum for the autonomic regions in Spain, whether it's Catalonia, the Basque Country, etc. 
So they would be violating Article 1 of the Constitution, Article 2 of the Constitution, Article 9 of the Constitution, which says very clearly that uh, there's a unity in Spain. And then one of the, one of the big achievements of the post-Franco era was to create autonomy regions, which will enable each region in Spain that has its own identity in many ways to have autonomy governments, autonomous okay. governments. This referendum is illegal, it's non-legally binding, it's not being approved by, this, by, uh, by a reform of the Constitution because there's no reform that allows this referendum. This goes against the very law under which the autonomous region in uh, Catalonia rules itself. Okay, so this so is let's totally ask, illegal. Let's ask Oriol. Let's ask Oriol. Oriol, you have a rich, diverse, vibrant, autonomous region. Why are you breaking the Constitution and going ahead with this referendum? Javier is against it. Yes, uh, we the Catalans uh, feel as a nation, so we think we have the right of the, to decide which will be our future, and that's all we want to do. We want to solve that kind of problems that uh, many times in history has been solved in uh, very horrible ways, just by talking, just by a dialogue, just like, giving the people the right to express their political opinion. All what we want to do is to hear population. We can talk through this television, for example. Journalists can write in the papers. Politicians can speak in, in many kinds of meetings, uh, uh, in the Congress, everywhere. But uh, why don't we hear the people and let people decide what they want to do? That's, that's so simple, and that's the way in the, in the 21st century we think we have to solve the political mm -hmm. situation. Uh, talking about what the Constitution is saying, uh, we have to remember that that Constitution was really uh, a step forward. It was, uh, was good for half a democracy when in the, in the time that we were living just a dictatorship. So in that historical moment, it was really a step forward. But it doesn't, it doesn't put many things very clear. For example, the Constitution is talking about that Spain is composed by uh, nationalities and regions, but don't say who is a region and who is a nationality. And we the Catalans know and we feel, and a vast majority of Catalans feel, as we as a nation. So we want to just to decide. There are Catalans who want to remain in Spain. We respect that point of view, of course, and they can express and we want to give them the right to express. But there are other Catalans that say that the things that the Spanish government is not defending our okay. in industry or Oriol, our let me interest. Ask you, let so me ask we, you if we they just those think uh, that people have to talk. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, right? So those Catalans who want to stay with Spain, if they are in the majority come October 1st and they vote no, yeah. and the people of Catalonia yes. vote no, will you respect that and put this away? Yes, of course. Okay. Of course, no doubt about that. <laughs> we just want people, let people decide. And I think that democracy is based on this, and you can explain it as complicated as you want. Mm -hmm. But everybody knows that democracy is based on the right of people to decide. And okay. if Catalan people would say no, we will respect, of course. Okay, Leopoldo, has Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy handled this situation well or badly? Well, Mariano Rajoy has not been able to handle uh, the situation uh, uh, rightly. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he seems not to have understood uh, well enough that it takes two to stay together, but it takes only once to divorce. And uh, the demand uh, who is uh, uh, who, uh, the demand which is now being uh, uh, forwarded by the people of Catalonia is a democratic demand that cannot uh, go ignored. Um, it's not uh, um, uh, people rallying in the streets with uh, casseroles for for the right of decide uh, half a million of uh, separatists, as the government mischievously uh, claims. But the overwhelming majority of the Catalonian people who is demanding the right to decide. And I think this, this, uh, this is a democratic demand that simply cannot go ignored. Uh, uh, beside, uh, one more thing ab about sure. this, which is the idea that uh, um, all, all this class comes from a broken consensus 
uh, over the past, uh, over the recent uh, political past in Spain. The present situation uh, has to be traced back to a broken consensus in which the Catalonians tried to um, um, introduce a legal reform of their statute a few years ago, but it encountered a fierce opposition of the popular uh, party who uh, was then in the opposition in Madrid and blackmail the central government over the question of the uh, statute reform. The Popular Party filed a lawsuit against the uh, reform of the statute, and the Supreme Court eventually ruled against it. Right. There, there of the accumulated resentment of the Catalonian people now. OK, so Leopold, you say there's a broken consensus. I want to go back to Javier here. Javier, you mentioned that they violated the Constitution. You say this is illegal. Yes. Let me ask you about Article 155 of the Constitution because you're wedded to that idea and a unified Spain. Article 155 could be activated by the Spanish government suspending Catalan autonomy. This is almost, you know, punishing them for wanting to vote, punishing them for wanting to have an opinion. Would you agree that that would cause a lot of chaos and a lot of trouble? I, I, I agree that I would <clears throat> be a counterproductive to apply this article, and I doubt that it's going to happen. I don't think that would be necessary because this referendum has, is not legally binding. It's not, it hasn't got a, sort of any kind of legal basis. But on the other hand, we have to understand that I understand Oriol when he mentions that this is a constitution that is almost 30 years old, that there was a post-Franco era, and therefore things have changed. Correct. I have no quarrel with that. The thing is that in order not to have to apply that Article 155, you would have to, in order to enable uh, a, a referendum, you would have to reform the Constitution. Obviously, the Constitution is 30 years old. Other countries in the world have reformed the Constitutions when things had changed along the years. But you would need three-fifths of the Senate and the Congress to approve a reform of the Constitution in order to enable a new articles and new reforms which would enable, again, uh, Catalonia to call mm -hmm. for a referendum. Okay. But on the other hand, but I, I, so we're talking about, yeah, the, this Article 155 would be counterproductive to apply, but it won't give a choice. It wouldn't be, the Madrid won't have a choice but to apply it if they want to go ahead with a referendum which has no legal basis whatsoever. In terms of talking about the majority of Catalonians, if we are talking about opinion polls, you cannot have an referendum every time an opinion poll is in favor of you. You have to talk about mandate, not opinion polls. And the mandate that the, the Catalonians have is uh, most people voted in 2015 for parties that did not support or do not okay. support independence. Let's the pro-independence okay, party Javier. only got 47% sure. of the votes uh, you, you, in that you, election. You put a bunch of points there. Let, let's go to Oriol. Oriol, to a point that was made earlier, are you blackmailing Madrid? Because that seems to be a point that both Leopoldo and Javier believe to be true. Are you blackmailing Madrid? Speak about the change of constitution is a bit tricky. Everybody knows here that to change the constitution is a very difficult way, which needs a majority in the Congress, needs a majority in the Senate, and then you have to put new elections. And uh, what he's saying, who is saying that, that the Catalans has to wait to, to wait for a, for a change of constitution is that we have to wait forever. And, and the, the, the reality is that the 92 article of the present constitution lets the government to ask about anything. And also there is another article where the Spanish government, if they want, they can, they can uh, give a, a, a competency to the autonomous government. So if they want, they can give the competence of the, uh, to the autonomous government to make a Catalan referendum, or they can organize a, a Catalan referendum or a Spanish referendum if they want through the 92 article. So there are possibilities, if they want, to, to hear the people. And everybody knows in every country in the world that in a, in a democratic <coughs> country, you can hear the people if you want. Okay. It's not a problem to ask the people. Okay, so, so Javier, Javier, <coughs> listen to the people. Is that Democracy probably, evolves. Probably the Spanish government doesn't want to listen. Okay, and so Javier. They are not interested so in listening to the opinion of the Catalans. Okay, so Javier, why, aren't, why isn't the Spanish government listening? Democracy evolves. You have to listen to the people. Yeah, but, you know, again, I'm going back to the point I'm making about reforming the Constitution to enable a referendum for independence. It does, no. that's, that's the right you, procedure. You, can do you a know, you legally with the change the present constitution. The, the first sorry. second, but we mustn't forget you know at the that. same time that, the, that according to the constitution, according to Article 964, the constitutional tribunal 
is the basis of the legality of the way things go in Spain based on the Constitution. And the Constitutional Tribunal has already ruled out any kind of autonomous uh, uh, sort of you know, referendum. There's no. no agreement. You see, for example, if you have the problem, the situation with Scotland, for example, when the referendum happened in 2014, it was an agreement between the Parliament in Westminster and the local and the autonomous region, which enabled this referendum to happen, which yes. we know the no vote won. And yes. in the case of Spain, and of course the UK does not have a written constitution. In the case of Spain, you have to have a constitutional reform to enable okay. to call for okay. a referendum. And again, and you don't have that. I don't <laughs> want to get into the legalities <laughs> of the constitution. I, I want to say something on that. Ariel, if I very can. briefly on this. Yes. Yes. No. Yes, I, 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 li I like the example of, the, of the, what has happened in the United Kingdom, but the difference is not between the Scots and Catalans. The, the difference is, be is between the Spanish Prime Minister <laughs> and the British Prime Minister, because David Cameron says, I want to hear the people. Right. I want to listen what the, Scot does, what the Scots want, and I will follow what the, Sco the Scots decide. The okay. Scots <clears throat> votes no, that's okay. And that's the key yeah. point, that, that, because okay. if that, that any, be any democratic so, government on, in any on. country wants yeah, to I want to bring in I want to bring in Leopoldo Javier just a moment please Leopoldo yeah. as was mentioned yeah, there's a kind of that... there's a social contract here right there's a social consensus in many ways that Spain as a nation was yes. built in the post Franco era where you have these regions where people are quite different but they're still under the umbrella of Spanish nationalism is the fundamental fear Leopoldo in Madrid that after Catalonia, you'll see Andalusia, you'll see the Basque region, and so on. You'll see all these regions eventually break away. Is that the existential and fundamental fear in Madrid? I don't think um, Andalusia will be uh, very much the case. But uh, of course, there is the fear that uh, uh, Catalon Catalonian uh, demands may be followed by the uh, similar demands in the uh, Basque country, uh, and so on. But in any case, uh, w what I think is at stake here is the fact that when the government is facing a challenge of this sort, uh, it is politics, not uh, the courts of justice, that uh, um, what needs to be used to confront the situation. And as a matter of fact, I think the uh, um, uh, position of the popular party now in government is fundamentally incorrect on that particular count, because the popular party is using the law as an alibi not to confront politically the situation. It's using um, the uh, old principle according to which people are there to serve the laws and not the laws to serve uh, the people. So therefore, if uh, um, one uh, wants to find out, to find a way out of this stalemate. It is politics, not the rule of law, what we uh, need. This, this I say independently of, on mm -hmm. how difficult it might actually be um, uh, to um, uh, change the constitution, which uh, right. I okay. think it's not uh, over the table. Okay, in good any point. Case. So, so, Javier, instead of instead of going yeah. in a granular way and looking at the constitution and the legality or illegality of it, it's politics. Mm -hmm. It's listening to people, right, Javier? Of course it is. Yes, of course it is politics, but how do you base your need to call for a referendum? Are you talking about opinion polls? Now the opinion polls might be in favor of referendum, but in mm -hmm. back in March they were against. When you cannot use opinion polls as a basis to, sp to break away from a country, you have to use a mandate, and the pro-independence parties do not have a mandate okay. because 40, they only got 40% of the votes Let's in the see how many people. in 2015. But, Therefore, but I guess the an majority test. of the no, Catalonians were against I guess, I guess an interesting test, Javier, would be how many people actually go to the polls on October the 1st. Very finally, Oriol, I want to ask you, is your movement divided, given that the president of Catalonia sacked the minister who said that you must submit to the will of Madrid, that you will submit to the will of the state? Uh, it sounds as if you're divided. It sounds as if the movement isn't very unified. Has that hurt you a lot? No, no, that is not true. We are very unified. There was a minister who, 
who resigns because he's, he, he's frightened every day, he's scared every day. Every day the Spanish government is frightening our, our public servants and they don't really want to, to listen to the people, but that's the key point. No, and no. <coughs> there's so a profound division if, there. If we hear the people... They're not unified, that's and, not and, true. And I, I agree, and I, I agree in something with Javier, that uh, uh, he says that uh, uh, poll opinions are not sufficient. We have uh, to have a democratic mandate. And in the last Catalan elections, the pro-independence party, uh, we had 48%, uh, but the parties against independence had just 39%. And there were a 12% of votes who goes to the parties who says, I'm not in the yes, I'm not in the no. But the yes was 48 and the no was 39. So if we want a democratic mandate, we have won in the last Catalan elections. But I can understand no, that no. that mandate wasn't so clear because a referendum is always more clear. Ah, ah, so well, we just we have to listen to people and we have legal ways to keep to listen to people. Okay. Javier, how Oriol, how and how Leopoldo, Javier. The results were if, okay. 48 to 39. If only 48% of Catalonians voted for pro-independence parties, that means that the majority of the people yes. did not agree okay. with independence. That That's was then. We're going to look forward to October. Only, Javier, and Oriol, sorry, and sorry, Leopoldo. I'm sorry, sorry I've got to jump in. I'm you sorry, have, sir. You have to say I the have whole truth. I have sorry, to the whole truth is only 39% votes to remain, no. okay. only 39. It doesn't matter, the majority so of people have to And there is an 80% who matter. wants to vote. I, I wish we could hang around, That's but irrelevant. gentlemen, That's I irrelevant. have to move on. Javier, Oriol, and Leopoldo, it's been a pleasure listening to all of you. I hope you'll all talk to me maybe <laughs> towards the end of September and in early October, because we'll be watching the story very closely. All the best to all of you. Still to come in the newsmakers, why these pills are causing problems in Poland. As the government restricts access to contraceptives, we ask if it's helping or harming Polish society. And houses of horror in Hong Kong. We ask the government if they're failing to address the cost and conditions of homes for the city's residents. Our government tries to implement various laws that strip away our rights to give birth humanely, to have access to the health service independently of the church. Much of the world's media turned its focus to Poland today, where U.S. President Donald Trump spoke in support of the country's conservative government. We decided to examine an issue the country is grappling with that's received less attention. Poland's president has recently signed into law a bill that restricts a woman's access to contraceptives. Specifically, women in Poland now need a prescription for the so-called morning after pill. Women's rights groups are outraged. Thousands protested the proposed changes back in March, saying rape survivors will suffer the most. Public medical appointments can take weeks and doctors are under no obligation to prescribe the pill. That's because of a conscience clause that exempts health professionals from performing services that go against their religious beliefs. Poland's abortion laws are some of the most restrictive in the European Union. It's only allowed in the case of rape, incest or danger to the mother's health. One European parliamentarian has called Poland's laws a counter-sexual revolution. Well, we invited a representative of the Polish Catholic Church onto the show. They preferred to give us a statement where they said anything that results in the death of an embryo is illegal under the Constitution and that the Church does not accept any form of contraception as it is incompatible with the natural law of protection of life from conception to natural death. Their team of bioethical experts emphasize that the morning after pill has a double mechanism. Both mechanisms destroy the physiological processes that allow for the proper maintenance of pregnancy or birth, and it opens the door to a significant cultural change of attitudes and interpersonal relationships. It promotes sexual freedom and the lack of responsibility for intimate relationships, trivializes human sexuality, destroys the ideal of exclusive relationships between men and women, and frees itself from responsibility for another. The Polish government also declined our invitation. But the health ministry gave us a statement which defended their position and rejected the criticism. They said changing the morning after pill to a prescription-only medicine is due to the fact that the patient's consumption of this medicinal product should be preceded by a visit to a gynecology specialist. 
They say thanks to the introduced regulation, the doctor will be able to assess whether the use of the drug will not adversely affect the patient's health, especially the minor. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from London by Peter Williams. He's the spokesperson for Catholic Voices and the executive officer for Right to Life organization. In Warsaw, we have Camilla Ferenc. She's a lawyer of the Federation for Women and Family Planning and a coordinator for the Lawyers Network. Also in Warsaw, Elzbieta Korolchuk. She's a sociologist, commentator, and women's rights activist. Thanks, all of you, for joining us. Camilla, if I can begin with you, you heard what the church had to say to us. You heard what the health ministry had to say to us. Tell me why you disagree with them. I cannot disagree with them because it limits uh, women's right to choose and they, in fact, it negatively influences uh, women's health and life, private life, but also all aspects of their um, activity in, in the world. So I cannot agree with, uh, with the uh, concept of protection of life from conception to, uh, to natural death because in the Polish constitution we have uh, given dignity to all humans but uh, given at the birth, at the moment of birth. So uh, what is more, we protect women due to Polish constitution and what uh, Polish authorities are trying to do is uh, decreasing their protection of women and their health and their right to choose. Elzebieta, tell me why you think this is a continuation of a trend that you don't like. Basically, it shows uh, quite uh, dangerous trends concerning not only gender issues and gender, gender equality, but also disregard for medical science and democratic procedures. Because at the same time, when the government introduces regulations concerning uh, the morning after pill being uh, only on prescription, uh, being available only on prescription. At the same time, they uh, loosen regulations concerning Viagra-like drugs, which has serious side effects. Uh, so it shows that women cannot make choices for themselves, but men obviously are able to. Uh, secondly, uh, there, are, th th there is a fact, medical fact, that these uh, medications actually uh, prevent fertilization process, while the church and uh, some of the right-wing uh, opponents of this medication being available to women claim that this is abortion mm -hmm. pill, which is simply not true. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, this is another case of the situation where uh, vital decisions about women's health and rights are made without wide social consultations. And this is a very dangerous trend for democracy. Peter Williams, our other two guests, the two women, the two Polish women, believe that this is a clear violation of women's rights. They're right, aren't they? No, not at all. In fact, the action that's taken by the Polish government is very much in keeping with the human right to life. Because let's be clear about what these pills are. We're talking about pills like Levanel, or which is the drug Levanorgestrel, or ELA-1, which is the drug ulipristal acetate. And what both of these are, are potential contragestives. People often don't understand what that means. What it means is that the uh, drugs prevent the already conceived unborn child from being implanted in her mother's womb. So it's deathly to the unborn child. And that's a fundamental violation of the right to life, which is a right which is uh, within the human nature of every single human being. Every single human being from conception till natural death, which is the biological definition of a human being, has that fundamental right to life. So it doesn't override any other rights. What it does, over, uh, what the um, morning after pill and things like that do override, however, is the fundamental right to life. And you don't have to be Catholic to see that. You don't have to be religious to see that. You just have to accept the humanity of the unborn child, the real, actual, scientifically verifiable effects of these drugs, and therefore what should follow logically from that is the expression within law of protections for the right. unborn child. So Peter, There's no right to abortion in international human rights law. Yeah, Peter, to you, it's clear that this is not a contraceptive, it's an abortion pill. No, I didn't say that. There's a difference between a contraceptive, a contragestive, and an abortifacient. An abortifacient is that which causes a miscarriage. A contragestive is that which does pretty much morally the same thing, but it's not the same thing physically, which is it prevents the child from being implanted in her mother's womb to begin with. So it's not an abortion pill, but it is a contragestive, and that has morally the same effect as something which causes an abortion, because it kills an unborn child. Okay. But it is also a contraceptive. It has that effect too. Right. So we have to be very clear about our distinctions here. Fair enough. Okay, Camilla. Let's look at it from the perspective of at least 43% of Polish people, right? So an April opinion poll showed that 
favored continued prescription free access to the morning after pill. The 43% that said no clearly are okay with this new law. They would use some of the similar, similar terminology that Peter did. Talk of, they talk of values, they talk of a moral responsibility to protect life. Um, do you accept that a large chunk of Polish people think more like Peter than they do like you? I cannot totally, I cannot uh, 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 agree with the terminology because we cannot speak about uh, a child when we are talking about embryo or fetus. It's not the same and, uh, and saying that's, that's a child, it's against knowledge and medicine. Uh, what is more, um, World Health Organization says that pregnancy starts when embryo is implanted into women's uterus. So before that, when Ella one for example, works, we cannot speak about pregnancy, we, can sp not, we cannot um, speak about abortion and such effects. And we have to remember about that, that we are talking about prevention from unwanted pregnancies. And we, if we stop women from having this uh, contraception, uh, uh, emergency contraception, the um, abortion underground will be bigger than now and it's always unsafe for women's life and health. And what is more, this, um, this product, this substance, uh, um, which is um, in El Lawan, uh, is totally safe for women, which is according, which is according to the uh, European Medicines Agency's um, mm -hmm. opinion. And sure. I think that more of the Polish society uh, supports, um, supports uh, having this non-prescription status of a law one okay. uh, in Poland, but the Polish authorities, uh, right. they really do not listen to uh, Polish society. Okay, and, and, and that brings me to, to ask Elżbieta, is the government, in your opinion, on the wrong side of history here? I think so, because um, the problem is, as I said, with uh, the definition of democracy, uh, there will be always uh, different opinions and views and values within the society. The question is whether we will uh, cherish this plurality, which is the basis of democracy, or whether we will introduce regulations in accordance to religious faith of the Catholic Church. And this is the problem. The problem starts when we start to introduce regulations with that within, without, as I said, uh, wider uh, consultations, and we do things according to the teachings of the church and not according to the modern science. Uh, unfortunately, uh, again in this program, there has been uh, an opinion which is not true. L1 is supposed to prevent the process of fertilization, and this is a fact. And unfortunately, the fact seems to not matter anymore in this discussion, and that is something that really mm -hmm. worries me. Yeah. Peter, it's not just Algebieta who's saying that this is not true. The European Medicines Agency guidelines were also along the lines of, hey, this is not dangerous. It may help um, ha uh, rape victims. It will make things better for people who don't want unwanted pregnancies. Peter, there were some accusations against well, you. You can respond. I certainly will respond. I think the facts of the matter need to be borne in mind, both biological facts and the facts about um, these particular drugs. I made it very clear earlier that this is, yes, a contraceptive drug, but it's also a contragestive drug. The beginning of pregnancy is irrelevant to that because a contragestive drug works to prevent an already conceived human being from implanting in her mother's womb. This is something which okay. is admitted by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. This is something which is um, admitted by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. It's something admitted by the British Na National Health Service. So I'm afraid this is simply a matter of fact. This is a contragestive but, form of drug Peter, and it a, does destroy an unborn child. Position, so right? therefore the right to life, which is the fundamental right, which is the sure. basis of democracy, because democracy has to be based on liberty and human rights, Peter. and human rights include the right to life. That has to therefore include the right to life of the unborn child, which both of the other speakers have unfortunately forgotten in what they're saying. The unborn child begins at conception and we, as human beings, end at natural death. You cannot deny it might be different in Polish, but in English, the, the definition of an unborn child is an unborn human being, and the unborn human being begins, as every embryological textbook mm -hmm. worth its salt will tell you, at the point of conception. So I'm afraid no. there's no debating on the facts here. This is a matter of an unborn child <laughs> being destroyed by a drug, which is not an abortion pill, but it is a contragestive. And if you're not willing to admit that, then you simply haven't got the requisite knowledge to be able to comment on this subject. Okay, well, we have a democratic debate here. Algebieta, you want to come in? 
Yeah, actually, I think that uh, the problem becomes uh, when people try to overcome science and try to, you know, uh, make definitions up uh, as uh, as it suits them. Because unfortunately, there is no moment of conception. There is a process of conception which takes sometimes hours, sometimes days, and this is science. So talking about, you know, the miraculous yeah. uh, moment of conception is simply not being in accordance with truth. Conception, and however, finally, regardless of whether it's moreover, a process or a there point, is, a problem is always with, the beginning There is of the a problem child. with, you know, talking about the situation, uh, talking about human rights uh, only in the case of fetuses or fertilized eggs, and forgetting about the human rights and uh, reproductive productive rights of women. This is the moment where we are uh, really in conflict because I think that in any case uh, there should be uh, regard for women's rights as human beings, as citizens, as people who can make decisions about whether or not they want to continue pregnancy or not. Uh -huh. And for you, unfortunately, as for many uh, opponents of uh, abortion and uh, reproductive rights, uh, the rights of the fertilized eggs seem to be more important, unfortunately, but I cannot um, you know, go it's not about having rights them. that and are I, more I important, it's, it's about having a basic right which is fundamental, which is the right the to life. And the right to life is absolutely basic for every single human being. I mean, you can call it no whatever right you want, it doesn't change law. the facts. There is no right to uh, have uh, your, un your unborn child destroyed. There simply is no such thing as a right to abortion under international human rights law or by any kind of philosophical logic. And whilst you may be willing to completely reject and ignore the findings of the Food and Drug Administration in the United States or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists or the British NHS, nonetheless, the facts are there. And I know that abortion lobbyists don't want to admit these facts, but they are there Okay, certainly you made your point. Camilla also has a right to free speech, and I want to bring her in now, and I want to ask Camilla moving forward. In October last year, I guess it can be considered as a success where there was the black protest where thousands of women went to the streets against the government's kind of blanket abortion ban, and the government then walked that back and then um, made a compromise, right? In March, you failed when you were protesting because this law got passed anyway. What happens next? Will you continue to fight against this morning after pill law? I think that now what we have to fight uh, with uh, are uh, still attempts to make um, the anti-abortion law in Poland, which in fact make abortion illegal, uh, giving only three restrictions, only three exception, restrictive uh, exceptions, uh, which in fact does not work um, uh, here in Poland. because. Doctors do not um, do not um, use this law. This law is not uh, respected at all uh, now in Poland, and we have to fight against attempts to uh, uh, introducing a total ban on abortion, which will be a tragic decision uh, here in Poland. Uh, uh, women would uh, die because of this new law if it will be binding uh, in the future. So um, anti-abortion. Um, uh, so uh, emergency contraception is only one step and they are trying to uh, to take more and more and it doesn't help uh, when someone uh, some someone like uh, our male guest uh, in this discussion uh, insists on uh, repeating some words that are art artificially uh, created by him and anti-choice um, organizations which are not true. There is not, nothing uh, such like um, unborn child. We, if we want to protect human lives, we, we have to start protecting women's, mm -hmm. uh, women who are trying to uh, get on somehow in this country, but it's getting more and more um, difficult right now when they cannot decide about their bodies right. and their health, in fact. Uh, that's a tragic situation and uh, we can try to um, mislead the public opinion by this terminology uh, that was presented before, but, uh, but it, it uh, leads to no, no, nowhere. Uh, we have to start, think, um, about, start to think about social costs uh, that are in uh, un abortion underground or abortion tourism that women have to face uh, nowadays in Poland. Okay, my final question for Elżbieta Korolczuk. Elżbieta, can Poland still be a modern secular democracy as a part of the European Union, underpinned by Catholic values that still has complete freedom for women? 
The problem is that, uh, you know, if you look at Catholic values, uh, there is uh, nowhere in the Bible uh, a passage which, which says that, you know, uh, women should be treated as incubators. So I think that this is more about, uh, not so much That's about Catholicism as a faith, but it's about the political role of the, uh, of the church as a political institution, which unfortunately overcomes democratic procedures, such as referenda, such as you know, public debates, such as social consultations, and try to uh, introduce this kind of uh, regulations through the back door by pushing the uh, politicians to accept them, this is although there is a huge religion. This is not about religion, opposition about on the part rights. of women. And it's not about so in that sense, that uh, so in that viewpoint. sense, as I as I said, view. it is about it is not about the religion. It is about uh, unfortunately the undemocratic attitude of the church as an institution. And this is something that saddens me because uh, the, fa the Catholic faith can be something wonderful, but unfortunately often it isn't. And in that sense, I'm afraid that what uh, is being done in the field of women's rights, reproductive rights, but also other types of rights, uh, is, in, is in conflict with the uh, human rights uh, definition, with the European, European values, and in that sense it is a part of a larger process of uh, Poland becoming more authoritarian and less democratic. And this is something that uh, really saddens me and makes me worried about the future and the fact that uh, people who claim that they fight, fight for, for human rights from other countries support this kind of undemocratic mm -hmm. uh, tendencies is even more okay. sad and unfathomable. Okay, Alcibiata and Camilla and Peter, I apologize because I've got to move on to other segments. But I thank you very much for joining well, us. Well, I, really I really think you should have given me the, the last word there. OK. All this week, we've been looking at Hong Kong, its politics, its environment, its culture. Today, it's housing. The city is one of the world's most expensive and unequal, with a staggering gap between rich and poor. It's also home to some of the most densely populated areas on the planet. For some of the city's poorest residents, their only place to live is a metal cage. If they're a little luckier, they'll have what's known as a cubicle home. Four walls and a space not much bigger than a coffin. Here's Natalie Pohonen with the final installment of our series of special reports from Hong Kong. Last year, the newsmakers met a man called Wong Tawa. He'd been living in a cubicle home for more than 20 years. We've come to the district of Mong Kok to ask Wong if he thinks anything will change with his situation under the leadership of new chief executive, Carrie Lam. So this is... <laughs> What's changed since last year? No change. No place. Wong has been living in this particular cubicle home for about four years, waiting for a spot to open up in public housing. And he has no idea if he's any closer to getting a home that's bigger than a box. No, 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 not yet. No, 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 <laughs> no, no paper, no legend. I don't, I don't want to ask them, uh, ask, ask, ask them uh, how, how long I, I will wait. Just, they will talk, they will send that out for, for me and then I uh, want to, want, want to, want to take the, the house. He gets money from the government to pay the rent of about $200 a month. There's no rent control, so when the subsidy goes up, the rent does too. Good. Wong yeah. introduces us to Betty Aridley. Here, she's my only best friend. I mean, she so, so always give me the food. I normally buy the food, she gives me. She gives me. I ask if the city's new leader, Carrie Lam, can comprehend what their life is like. Can. No, can't. Can. What could she do? An echo of the almost quarter of a million people waiting for a spot in public housing.
Hong Kong holds the dubious title of one of the world's least affordable cities when it comes to housing. With the kind of uh, prosperity that we enjoy, with such high GDP per capita, uh, we rank among you know, the top uh, in, all, among, in comparison to most countries in the world. Um, it is unacceptable and intolerable how Hong Kong people are living right now. Fernando Chung says the government does have the power to do something about this crisis, which affects people at many levels of society. But it hasn't shown the will to find viable solutions. Because while we are saying that we lack land supply for public housing, we continue to sell uh, land parcels to developers and uh, they continue to build luxurious housing. So it is not that we lack land supply. We have carved uh, a good size of land supply for private market. Uh, and when it comes to land for public housing, uh, the government seems to be dragging its feet. The city's previous leader, Leung Chunying, vowed to tackle the housing crisis. But after his five-year term, the divide between the haves and the have-nots has only widened. The territory's new leader hasn't made the same promise as her predecessor. But this is an issue which cannot be ignored. But how can a city be resplendent when people cannot even afford a space to call home. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers, Hong Kong. Well, my guest today is a man tasked with doing something about the situation. It's Andrew Wan. He is a legislative councillor for the Democratic Party and a member of Hong Kong's Housing Authority and its subsidised housing committee. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. The situation is not great. People in these cages or in cubicles they're graduates who are supposed to have decent housing. They don't have it. What are you doing to make it better? I think uh, the Hong Kong housing problem uh, is basically affected by uh, some internal as well as external factors. Uh, I think the internal factor, for example, the uh, collusion uh, of the government, the uh, businessman and the giant corporate, and the landlords, and even sometimes we uh, suspect the uh, triad society members. It is the main reason why the government has a tendency to protect the vested interest group in Hong Kong. So you say so, there's collusion. Uh, for this reason, we don't yes. have. So, yeah, you say there's collusion. Sorry to interrupt you. You say there's collusion. You are in government. How do you fix that from being within government? It's, it's your responsibility, right? In the Hong Kong situation, we are on the downside, honestly, because uh, only uh, one third of the uh, seat of the council of the Congress uh, are occupied by the uh, Pan Democrats, we call it. So uh, we just try to fight uh, hard, but uh, it seems that we cannot easily uh, re reverse the situation. So are you telling me that you can't do anything? No, uh, we are trying to propose and trying to organize the people to advocate some of the policy uh, reform. For example, uh, we urge the, the government to build more public housing. Uh, actually, we can do it. And we forced the government to promise in the long-term housing strategy to promise uh, to build a public housing and up to 280,000 flats. But uh, unfortunately, the government cannot uh, fulfill the, the task. And uh, in the coming five years, uh, we f forecast that the government has uh, about 44,000 uh, flat in short. So we just can uh, try our best to do better. And uh, another side, we try to uh, fight in the uh, Congress and uh, urge the government to provide uh, some uh, subsidized uh, housing for the targeted Hong Kong citizens. For example, we have uh, housing core home ownership schemes, which is uh, 
a private sector housing, but subsidized by the government. We urge the government to provide such kind of housing uh, uh, and mark the price according to the uh, construction cost and the uh, affordability of the targeted families. That is what I'm going to, to mm -hmm. do. And I hope, because you know, you know that, uh, it is, it is a, a new government phase. Just uh, the a new governor of Hong Kong, the new chief executive, uh, Carrie Lam, uh, she just uh, uh, inaugurated. And we urge her to uh, you know, follow our proposal. I hope that uh, she is going to listen. Yeah. Does it embarrass you that there are parking spots for sale for $600,000 in Hong Kong? Yes, I, I have heard some more expensive case also. Uh, some uh, uh, car parking came up to one million or over one million Hong Kong dollars. That is ridiculous. I think it is the most expensive in, in the world. Yeah. Do you trust Carrie Lam? Uh, we, I, I just want to say, especially she is a, a new CE chief executive, I hope that uh, she can keep uh, her promise and the pledge in the election, although she is not elected by the people, she seems to be appointed by Beijing government, by the uh, election committee, uh, uh, formed by only 1,200 1, people. But uh, at least we have to wait and see. We try our best as a congressman. We hope that our proposal, our advocacy, can be listened by the government. Okay, Andrew Wan, we wish you all the best. Thank you very much for joining us. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.